Hello, I'm Sami Zaydan. This is Counting the Cost on Al Jazeera, your look at the world of business and economics. This week, dire public services, regular power cuts and water shortages. Where did Iraq's oil wealth go? Also this week, the first COVID vaccine to win approval was based on mRNA technology. Does it represent the future for investments into cures? And Nigeria's huge oil industry, underperforming, polluting and wasteful. After more than three decades, can the government get a grip on the industry? Now, ranked as the fourth biggest oil producer in the world, you'd think Iraq had the financial resources to weather the pandemic and drop in oil prices. But that's not the case. Its fragile economy is struggling to cope, and it may have to turn to the International Monetary Fund for assistance. It has already devalued its currency by almost a fifth, enabling it to eke out more dinars for dollars. Well, this is the succinct appraisal of the World Bank. A precarious political situation, weak healthcare system, ineffective social safety nets, rampant corruption and dilapidated service delivery all amplify this fragility and have fueled large-scale protests across the country. Well, that begs the question, where does all of Iraq's oil wealth go? Well, up to 90% of Iraq's budget is dependent on oil exports. This year's budget is $113 billion. Almost half of that budget is spent on the civil service, but about 20% of those salaries go to people who do not exist. In other words, corruption. Its deficit, that's of course the difference between the money it raises and the money it spends, is expected to be about $50 billion. Baghdad will fill the gap by possibly collecting $6 billion from the IMF, by turning to international investors, but also by raising taxes on civil servants and pensioners. So Iraqis are being asked to carry the burden of corruption again. It's not only the people who are fed up with the government. Businesses have long complained about red tape. And some provinces want to bypass the government and cut their own deals for investment. Ambar province is one. It was retaken from ISIL control four years ago. Al Jazeera, Simona Faltin reports from Ramadi. Four years after it was largely freed from ISIL, construction in Iraq's western Anbar province is booming. Once complete, this mall in the provincial capital Ramadi aims to be the largest of its kind in Iraq. These projects are needed in this province, and according to our assessment and feasibility study, we believe these projects will be successful. Precious jobs have been created at a time when Iraq suffers from economic downturn and rising poverty rates. Before this project started, I was unemployed. The project helped many young people to get jobs, and it has helped reduce unemployment in the province. It's estimated Anbar has a non-oil sector investment portfolio worth $2 billion, one of the highest among Iraq's 18 provinces. The director of Anbar's investment commission says the relative stability around Ramadi over the past few years has created a business-friendly environment. Anbar's society believes in the authority of the civilian government. And because of that, we haven't had any armed groups for years. No one is allowed to carry weapons except for the government security forces. The local government in Anbar wants to develop vast, untapped mineral and gas resources and says it needs to attract more foreign investors, especially from the Gulf. But the Sunni province is demanding more leeway to circumvent the Shia-led government in Baghdad, known for its cumbersome bureaucracy and widespread corruption. We hope the central government gives us more authority in energy and electricity production. Many international companies propose projects in Anbar, but because of our limited authority and the complicated procedures of the central government, things have been delayed. The local government's push for investment doesn't just aim to develop Anbar's economy, it also underpins its political ambitions for greater autonomy from the central government in Baghdad. But some businessmen say decentralization alone won't solve their problems. This investor says it has taken more than two years to complete the paperwork for this hypochlorite plant and blames the local and central governments equally. He has spent millions of dollars, 
but is yet to receive a license. He didn't want to speak on camera for fear it might further complicate the process. Experts say until the government overhauls its regulations, few foreign investors will take the risk of setting up shop here. Al Jazeera's Simona Faltine reporting there from Ramadi. Right, let's discuss then where Iraq's oil wealth has gone. Joining me now from London is Ahmed Tabakjili. Ahmed is the Chief Investment Officer of the AFC Iraq Fund and a board member of the Credit Bank of Iraq. Good to have you with us. So our colleagues at Al Jazeera Arabic have reported that about $9 billion is going on salaries for people who don't exist. I'm wondering, how does a problem like this continue for so many years in Iraq? It's not like everybody doesn't know that there are these ghost salary issues going on in Iraq. Well, I think you, you've hit it on the nail. Everybody knows that we have a large number of ghost employees. Whether the figure is anywhere near the $9 billion, I think that's open for debate simply because we don't have precise numbers. We have at best at best guess estimate because the uh, the government itself does not have precise number of its own employees. That's one of the challenges uh, we have. The budget recognizes we have three point. Uh, two, billion, uh, 2 million employees. However, no one knows that is uh, true or not. So the 9 billion is, is maybe it's exaggerated, but the, the, the damage it does to the overall economy certainly is not exaggerated. Everybody knows, though, that um, there is this problem, Ahmed, of ghost salaries mm -hmm. and ghost employees. Where's the accountability? This has been going on for years. It's not the first budget that, where this uh, has surfaced, right? Absolutely, absolutely. This is definitely something that's been going on for years. However, uh, the important thing to keep in mind and to notice is that we are discussing the side effects. I mean, when it comes to this, when it comes to corruption, when it comes to all of these things, the things that we all in Iraq, if you ask any Iraqi, he says he or she would say we know about this stuff. However, we're looking at the symptoms. You know, the, 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 this kind of corruption is a symptom of a system that is at fault. So fundamentally, we have a core issue of the system, the, our current system of uh, muhasasa in which by every ministry, every department, every unit is pretty much um, taken up by certain uh, parties. That creates a condition in which such corruption takes place. Is it deeper than the Mohasasa or the quota system of divvying up budgets? Some might argue it's actually deeper than that. It's, it's that the politicians and the parties don't really represent the centers of power. It's the armed militias and factions behind them, and in some cases, foreign governments that really control the reality of Iraq. I think that that is always uh, uh, exaggerated. I mean, definitely it is the political parties that make up the system, whether have some, some have foreign or domestic or other affiliations, that's secondary. The main issue is the structure of the system. It's a, it's a structure of the Mahasasa itself. That is what is at fault. Because in a way, if you think about it, the difference between, I mean, the Mahasasa basically is the same illness that we all have in the Middle East one way or the other, which is the public sector becomes the way that citizens sort of get rewarded. The difference between Iraq and everywhere else is that we have become, you know, we create a monster version out of that, a Frankenstein version out of it, because we have multiple power centers and they all go after their own interests. All right, what's the bottom line for this then? Uh, they're going to have to turn to the IMF to ask for money? Foreign investors are going to uh, bring in the cash or is it going to be the taxpayers who foot the bill? Well, the thing is, it's, it's a multiple thing in a way. The problem with Iraq, as, as you know, is that we are, our budget is structurally unbalanced in that the public sector payroll takes over everything. In a low to medium low oil price environment, okay, what we have right now is, you know, oil price Brent are at 60 and so we all feel relieved, but that is a cyclical issue. Secondly, long term, there is less and less demand for oil. So let's forget where oil prices are right now, because, you know, th this year we are talking of 60, last year we were talking of 20. So, you know, it, it, that's highly unpredictable. However, for us, our budget is structurally imbalanced. Public sector pay takes over almost everything. So at some stage, if we don't fix our house, we need to go to the IMF. And the IMF would say, sure, but to give you the aid, you have to restructure the public sector payroll and other other items. If that happens, 
certainly you will get foreign investors. Just witness what happened in 2016 when Egypt embarked on its own program that the IMF approved of. It gave it an extended fund facility, which was about $12 billion, and foreign investors flocked into Egyptian bonds. So if we fix our house, if we fix our structural imbalances, because unlike many other countries, even when things are terribly wrong, Iraq is incredibly wealthy. Look at last year. Last year was a terrible year for us in terms of low oil prices. Yet, we still sold something like 42 to $43 billion worth of oil. So for us, it's not a question of revenues. It's a mismatch between revenues and expenditures that eat up all these revenues. And that's really what, what we need to fix. If we fix it with the IMF's work and blessing in terms of a program that is actually real and credible, then foreign investor would come. Otherwise, we Iraqis have to pay for it. And we already pay for it because we allow the public sector to be everything, leaving no room, starving the investment in underlying infrastructure. Right. So in a way, it's us and the government. We need to wake up. All right. Thanks so much, Ahmed Tabakchali there. Thank you for your time. Appreciate that. There's tradition and then there's innovation. For a long time, traditional vaccines were made by weakened or inactive viruses or parts of them. And this certainly has been successful in helping to eliminate everything from measles to polio. But the breakout technology of the COVID-19 era has been messenger RNA. It sends a code to your cells to develop an immune response. The leaders in this field, BioNTech, the German company owned by the children of Turkish immigrants, has seen its stock surge 300% in the last 12 months. US biotech company Moderna produced a vaccine that was 95% effective, the best of all vaccines produced so far. Its stock surged 778%. And it's not surprising that Big Pharma have been buying stakes in these manufacturers. AstraZeneca is the biggest shareholder in Moderna with a 7.7% stake. And GlaxoSmithKline, which had a troubled attempt with its partner to develop a COVID-19 vaccine, has bought a 10% stake in German biotech CureVac. Well, this is where the technology gets really exciting. You see, it offers the potential to create drugs and vaccines for cancer, which kills 10 million people worldwide. Well, joining me now from Rabat, the capital city of Morocco, is Dr. Azadine Ibrahimi. Azadine is the director of MedBiotech, the medical biotechnology lab, and head of the biotechnology lab at the Rabat Medical School. Good to have you with us. So in technological terms, just how important is mRNA to science and humanity? Well, actually, thank you for having me to talk about this technology, but it's great, I think, and I'm amazed that we could do it actually these days. And uh, we thought it would be a dream for many years. But now I think we are getting closer and closer to having this technology applied and actually being able to produce proteins and cure a lot of diseases that we couldn't actually think about it. But to make it easy to understand, actually, this technology is kind of the, the software of life. So what you do is just you bring and information, genetic information to the cell, and the cell will be producing any protein kind of that you need or to correct any defect that you have through the expression of this protein. All right, so give me an example of maybe some of the diseases which we haven't been able to treat in the past, which we might now be able to do with this technology, mRNA. Well, actually, all the, the monogenic diseases, meaning that one gene is defecting in a cell, it, it theoretically will be able to do it. So cystic fibrosis actually is one of them. Cystic fibrosis actually is based on one protein that is the, the CFTR protein that is really having a lot of mutation and it's not working. So it will be easy if we think theoretically about it, easy to bring this mRNA that is correct form of the cell and bring it to the cell, and the cell will be able actually to produce the right protein that will go to the membrane and be able to function correctly. And that will save a lot of people and a lot of pain. So it's a lot of example, but cancer will be another one that we could come back to it. All right. I mean, you've mentioned cancer and cystic fibrosis. How far are we away from finding a cure to those diseases? Well, that's a one billion question, actually. But I'm just trying to say that... Uh, 
we came actually the dream to have this kind of technology is not from today it's from many years ago and i think we we're dreaming basically to reproduce what we could do the cell could do naturally so we thought since the beginning if it would be possible to do the same thing to correct the defect that we have in people the only problem with that is just the the body on the cells they have their own mechanism of defense and every time we brought up this mrna the software of life for uh, to to for the correcting the defects the pro the body or the cells will be rejecting them so now we we hopefully get to the point where we can actually and that was one of the nicest things about covid that will be able actually to bring these proteins the body will take them the cell will take them and be able to produce them so i think we are not that far from the first application and we have to combine that with another technology that is a really great also is the nobel prize of this year crispr cas9 and the crispr cas9 system is kind of correcting directly the defects on the dna so that if we combine the two technology i think the the future will be i have no idea how it can be the future well outside of the united states and germany is anyone working on that future using this kind of technology particularly in the developing countries well, I think now uh, I don't I don't think that there is that many countries working on that even in developed countries actually because this technology stayed kind of in these two countries but I think now with the covid-19 and the, the success of incredible success of this uh, two mRNA vaccine we never thought that we'll have a vaccine with 95% efficacy that's something we we dreamt about and i think seeing that a lot of people are thinking about it and they think the solution for all these countries is to go to this technology do a transfer and they think it's 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 feasible let's end on a nice positive optimistic outlook, especially since we're talking about COVID. Thanks so much, Dr. Azadeen. Thank you. Thank you, Sehmi. Thank you very much. Nigeria's oil industry has been dogged by allegations of mismanagement, corruption and environmental damage. The government is hoping to get to grips by rehabilitating refineries, cutting down flaring and cleaning up oil leaks. Ahmed Idris takes a deep dive into Nigeria's oil industry. This is one of Nigeria's government-run oil refineries in the city of Port Harcourt. But most of its operation has been shut down to upgrade equipment and facility. The government plans to hand over these money-losing ventures to investors to run after decades of mismanagement. Africa's biggest oil producer has turned from self-sufficiency in refined petroleum products in the 1970s and 80s to now a net importer of the products. Its four plants continue to operate well below capacity and sometimes shut down for months. Officials say that has to stop. What we have done different now is to make sure that we know what we are doing, we know who will do it, and we go back to the original refinery builder, such a way that you don't you make no mistakes about the delivery of that project. And that is well on course. There's a new urgency to complete the commercialization process. Nigeria has been hit by lower oil prices and a weakened global demand. The government, desperate to show up its revenue base, sees the refineries as a way out of an expensive fuel import regime, subsidized at more than $2 billion a year. Oil industry sources say between July and September last year, the country imported more than 5 billion liters of refined products. A subsidy program that allowed those connected to politicians to steal hundreds of millions of dollars annually has caused the government huge losses in the past. It scrapped the subsidy three years ago. But still, the losses continue to mount. There we have a line of sight with when this will be achieved, when this will be uh, delivered, and ultimately we can be, well, Nigeria will become the hub of petroleum product in the West African sub-region. Some Nigerians say they are cautiously optimistic. If these national assets are revamped and properly run, uh, in spite of the age of the technologies that, that produced them over 50 years ago, there are still refineries of that age around the world that are still fully functional. So I think they can be rejigged to a point where they will still come back to their functionality, but in such a way that the, the government of Nigeria, the peoples of Nigeria still have their stake 
in the refineries. The Ido Obosiku community has been living in the shadows of three gas flare points since 1970. People here say the flares damaged their lives and livelihoods. The suit suits everywhere. Our roofs don't last. Our crops cannot germinate properly. No good water. The aquatic life have moved because of the pipe crossing the river. For us to get fish now, we have to paddle more than uh, 10 miles. He says compensation paid to some has done little to ease their pain. And they aren't alone. Fires like these burn throughout Nigeria's oil-rich delta. Oil companies still find it more convenient to burn away the gas, even though it could be used to generate electricity. An estimated 23 million cubic meters of gas is being flared every day from 174 points like this, costing Nigeria about a billion dollars annually. The government says it's a waste and if stopped could add 3,000 megawatts of electricity in a country that is struggling to generate 4,000 megawatts. Because of the difficulty in enforcing a total ban, in 2019 Nigeria launched an ambitious project to increase domestic use of gas and export. This, it hopes, will cut the waste and save lives and the environment. The fact that it is environmentally friendly, it is cheaper, it also enables quick industrialization and growth. And we didn't do this over a long period of time. It's, a, it's an issue, but we can't continue to lament. And that's why this project will do two things. One is to deliver on previous uh, attempts to have a trans-African gas pipeline, which will deliver gas through the Mediterranean into Europe, and also to deepen the gas consumption uh, within our, our country. In boosting domestic consumption, government is also promoting the use of compressed natural gas in vehicles. But the most effort is to see a drastic reduction in gas flaring. We're actually giving out those flares uh, to people to manage and we believe that uh, uh, we'll be able to uh, take care of all the gas flares within the next few years. The government is hoping that the petroleum industry bill in parliament for 20 years will soon pass and attract more investments in oil and gas. Officials say that will further boost gas utilization and help minimize flaring. Until then, communities like Idu Obosuku may have to live with the damage caused by the gas flares blazing at their doorsteps. Workers agitate a riverbed to flush out trapped oil in Bodo Creek. As the oil comes to the surface, a boom traps the sludge for evacuation. It's a job the contractors hired by oil giant Shell must quickly accomplish before the tide returns. The cleanup is due to litigation against the company following a massive oil spill in Ogoni in 2009. The scope of this work is to remediate uh, the polluted areas in Border Creek and uh, after that the next phase will be the restoration, revegetation of the mangroves and the monitoring. So far it's a 1,000 hectares. While Shell and its contractors say they've done a lot of some sides, the Nigerian government-led decontamination effort jointly funded by the Shell company is off to a slow start. Heavy machinery is now deployed further inland to excavate and treat contaminated soil. We are not on target from what we had planned, but we're trying to see what we can do to catch up. There's still a lot of work to do to catch up and meet our target. An assessment by the United Nations Environment Programme, first published in 2011, shows that pollution from more than half a century of oil production was worse than originally thought. The report recommended a $1 billion fund to clean up Ogoni alone, an area covering 1,000 square kilometers. The work, which began six years later, could take at least 25 years to complete. Much of Ogoni is a wasteland. This mangrove is dead as fish and crustaceans no longer spawn here. Farmlands, fish ponds, and even underground water supplies have been polluted by hydrocarbons leaking from old pipelines. We could expect Some activists in the region are less impressed with the work so far. Other communities in the Niger Delta felt that if it works for the Ogoni people, then there is hope for other communities in the Niger Delta because the Ogoni case is just one case out of several, several communities in the Niger Delta. 
And how many years down the line we are not getting it right in Ogonis. And that's not the only concern. Significant amount of oil theft continues in the region, further complicating the process of reversing the environmental damage. Experts believe 15 to 20,000 square kilometers more of Nigeria's oil producing region require the attention Ogoni is currently receiving. They fear that unless the entire region is decontaminated, Ogoni's cleanup may in the end be a waste of time and resources as recontamination could occur. Ahmed Idris from Nigeria there. And that's our show for this week, but there's more for you online at aljazeera.com slash ctc, where you can catch up on past episodes. That's it for this edition of Counting the Cost. I'm Sami Zaydan from the whole team here. Thanks for joining us. The news in Al Jazeera is next. <laughs>